but I don't know how to explain for you. Well, good morning to you all. Thank you for being here. And I want to thank also our distinguished panelists. It's a privilege for us to have uh, Dave Cameron, uh, Don Kabaruka, and Jennifer Widener, who's running a little late and should be here shortly to join us. Uh, and it's, I'm really happy that Leslie Routon is going to be uh, moderating this panel in a moment. Uh, they will very quickly give you some information that will reinforce why you made the decision to come to this event this morning. <laughs> Which is, you know, if I have just one number that I took away from this, it's that in 2030, half of the poor people in the world will be living in fragile states. And if half of the poor people in the world are living in fragile states, and if the focus of the world's efforts to develop uh, those parts of the world which aren't quite there yet, support their development, uh, also needs to then reflect that balance in our work. The fundamental question is, are we today organized to do that? Do we think about the issues facing fragile states and the solutions that will help them to make progress in a way that reflects the dimension of the problem that we have there. I think that's going to be the focus of this discussion. So let me simply just uh, say now, this is a morning on fragile states at CGD. So we're going to have this panel, and then we're going to have a very short uh, break of 10 minutes, and then continue uh, with the second panel with Paul, uh, Paul Collier, who's uh, here, uh, also with Ahmed al Suswa, who's sitting here, and uh, Charles Collins, who's going to be coming, uh, where we're going to talk not just about this report and its work, but also some very interesting work that the IMF has produced on fragile states. And I think there'll be a very nice uh, second phase to this. Uh, a bit of housekeeping. If you still haven't turned your phones off to silent, this is the moment to do so. So I recommend that you do that. Uh, can I also encourage you to live tweet if you want to using hashtag CGD talks. And finally, once we finish with this panel, if you would be kind enough to just stay seated for a moment while the panelists leave, and then uh, we will uh, take a break and carry on from there. So with that, let me turn it over to Leslie. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, everyone. Well, I don't feel like, I don't feel like I need to introduce you because everybody knows who both of you are, but um, um, you know, this is the launch of the uh, Escaping the Fragility Gap um, report. Um, it's a, been a year of work for both of you. Um, David Cameron, former pr uh, Prime Minister for Britain, and um, Donald Dab Kabaruka, who I've known for many years since you were Finance Minister in Rwanda, <clears throat> the head of the African Development Bank. And now, I have to find it actually, because you're the High Representative on the African Union Peace Fund. Correct. Good. And as uh, Ms. Suits said, Jennifer's going to join us later. She's been caught up in, um, I guess it's the red line. Um, anyway, let's, let's get this to a start because we've already had an interesting debate behind the, the early, from early this morning with um, a roundtable with the, the press. Um, what are you, f what, is this really, is this report, this report is about fragile states and has been a long debate since, since I can remember. Are you saying that the development model of fragile states um, hasn't worked? 
fundamentally, yes. Um, thank you, first of all, for coming. Um, <coughs> and sorry about the English weather, which I brought with me. It was actually 25 degrees back in the UK. Actually, in, in old money, that's about 70, I think. So it's pretty, pretty hot. But, but good to be here. Yes, I think we are. Look, I am the biggest supporter of international aid and development. Very proud to have been Prime Minister and delivered 0.7% of gross national income in aid, the only G7, well, the first G7 country to, to do that. But I think we have to recognize, while there have been huge successes for overseas development and assistance, and look at vaccination programs and school building programs and poverty reduction programs, I think we have to accept in the most fragile states, we haven't made a lot of progress. And so this report basically says, as was in the introduction, the significance is going to grow because soon half the world's poor will be in these fragile states as India and China grow and take care of their own poor. But it also says we've got to do things differently. And then I think what we do is we set out a whole series of things uh, that we should do in a different way to what we do now. Um, in the past, we have tended to overload fragile states with dozens of policy priorities and set them up for failure. That needs to change. We need to strip back and focus more on the basics of security and prosperity. We've tended to say to countries, here's a set of things that we think you ought to do and here's the money that comes with that. And actually in some ways that has undermined the very institutions that you need to build up in fragile states. So we think a better model is say, you come up with your national plan, your national priorities, and we will back that. And instead of policy conditionality, let's have governance conditionality where you know, if the money is um, stolen or if there isn't a clear audit trail, you won't get any money, but it is your plan and your policies. Um, and then, of course, the most controversial thing I think we say is that uh, for many good reasons, uh, countries, donor countries have wanted to see rapid progress towards elections. But sometimes we have, there's been an over hasty rush. And I think what we find in this report is that work done on power sharing, on fundamental political settlements, on checks and balances. Get that right before the move to multi-party elections. And then the move towards genuine democracy is likely to be more um, sustainable. So I think there's a series of what I would call inversions. We used to load up the priorities, simplify them. It used to be our priorities, make it your priorities. It used to be a rush to elections, get the power sharing right. And then there are big changes, which I'm sure Paul Collier uh, and others will talk about in your next panel about the way the IMF works, the way the World Bank works, the way that um, development finance institutions work. Um, but we're, hope, we're, we're hugely optimistic. We think that there are pathways out of fragility if we do things um, differently. So I think that's why uh, I've really enjoyed working with these brilliant academics um, from the UK, but right across the US and with policy practitioners from you know, from Rwanda, from Yemen, from Pakistan, from all over the world, to come up with what I think is quite a challenging report and a whole set of things that if we do differently, will lead to much better results. Donald. Do well, Donald, um, you know, if, if one looks at fragile states, I mean, why the sudden attention we've had? There's been fragile states, you know, I'm thinking specifically um, about Africa here, but there's been fragile states that, you know, that have gone back um, decades and decades and nothing has been done about it. So what, what David's really saying is that, well, there's had to be a rethink about this. And maybe what's been, you know, and clearly what's been done is not working. Right. What, what do you say? Not clear. There have to be a reset, uh, if not a reboot, uh, for the reasons which David just mentioned. SDGs in 2015 were agreed upon. A number of assumptions were made, which are now clearly not working. And I do think that, uh, uh, the fact that of all the fragile states and all the billions of money spent on them, only a few today can show success, as Paul Kohler was saying, is itself proof that there's something wrong. I was saying yesterday at uh, the World Bank uh, that in public school, in public policy schools, they teach us that a good policy has three elements. It must be technically sound, politically feasible, and deliverable. It seems to me that we have made assumptions about these policies, that they were sound. Maybe they were. But they could not be delivered. They are not feasible in many places. And so we have to go back now, instead of saying, OK, it's, not, it's about capacity, you know, delivery. Or it's about these politicians have to get an election right. No, we have to go back to the policies themselves and ask the question, what is it that works? And this is what the, uh, the document does on the basis of very solid research. Second point. I want to emphasize that fragility is not necessarily 
or always about conflicts. So some of the solutions which have been provided always assume there is a conflict. There have not been a conflict in Haiti. Yet it's one of the weakest fragile states on planet Earth. So there have to be policies which assume different sources of fragility. And I think Cristalina was saying to us yesterday, there might be many of them in the future on the basis of um, either contested borders or even the environment. One more last point. I think David Cameron and uh, his predecessors were amazing in getting the British people and the British government to commit to 0.7. Many other G7 countries uh, have not done so. And the money which has been deployed has been extremely helpful. However, it is not always about money. It's about money and many other things. I think the assumption that because there is money, there will be solutions, is one of the things we have to revisit. Uh, money is needed, but in places like South Sudan, actually money could be a problem. As the rent seekers fight for, for the money. And so there is a case to review policies, and there's a case of learning from what is it that works, from places like Timor Leste, from Rwanda, from Colombia, and many other places. So we're not saying that we have got prescriptions for ending fragility. We're only questioning the assumptions which have been made up to now and offering a different way of looking at fragility. So, so David, let's come back to the most controversial of these ones, which is um, the elections. Mm. I mean, you're saying that um, as countries emerge from conflict or instability, um, well, let's from conflict, because you, you're talking about, you know, the mm. winners and the losers. Is it going to be easy to have everyone in a, um, uh, an interim government? It's not easy at all. But I think the, <coughs> the, the thinking in this report is that if you move very swiftly from conflict to elections, you will have one person, one vote, but you'll probably have one person, one vote once, and that'll be it, because one of the parties to the conflict will win the election and then use the institutions of the state to reward their supporters and not govern the country in a way that will help it to exit fragility. Whereas if you focus <coughs> on getting the power sharing right, if you focus on the checks and balances on the operation of power, uh, you've got a far better chance when you do move to elections of making it sustainable. And one of the things we say in this report is, um, in the past, we've sometimes used the leverage that we do have as donor countries to say, right, here's the leverage, let's get on with the constitution writing, let's get on with the elections. Whereas what we should have done is said, actually, let's get on with the power sharing. South Sudan being perhaps quite a good example. Mm -hmm. I think part of the international community thought, right, okay, we solved the problem. There's going to be Sudan, a predominantly Muslim country. There's going to be South Sudan, a predominantly Christian country. It's going to have money from, from aid and oil and, and let's get on with elections and it'll all be, be fine. And of course, the fundamental settlement between uh, the tribal cleavages in South Sudan wasn't thought through properly. And actually what we should have done, and we say this in the report, is use the leverage of the fact there were only two sources of money. There was oil money and there was development money to, to make sure the checks and balances and the power sharing are put in place. So it is a different way of thinking about the sequencing. I'm sure some people will say, oh, you're, you're being anti-elections and anti-democracy. Absolutely not. I'm a profound... Democrat, small d Democrat, I should say, here in the United <laughs> States. Um, but if you want a sustainable democracy, a real democracy, get the power sharing right to start with. You're right, though, it's not easy. And we do say this, that, that there may be some groups that you have to exclude because their red lines are unacceptable. I mean, if a party to the conflict is still committed to conflict, then there's no point including them in the power sharing agreements. I mean, power sharing worked in Northern Ireland because the IRA put their arms beyond use verifiably and were prepared um, for their associates to enter a political process. So, so you have to check that the red lines are compatible, but at that stage you should try and include as many as you can into the political settlement for the country. So yeah. if the... Could if I, the yeah, I, okay, go ahead. Could I, could I add this though? Part of the conflicts in the fragile states is a phenomenon called uh, the coalition of permanent losers. So you have an election. Whose election you can results you can already tell from the beginning. So you end up with groups who consider themselves losers and they consider themselves potential permanent losers. And then they form coalitions. And you have thereby an element of instability for the future. They will go like the Central African Republic 
from an election to an election. Because the basic issue is not resolved. And so I want to, to argue, like David has just done, that an electoral process outcome to get a fair government, a government delivers, that is accountable, is an objective which we completely share. The issue is how to get there, and what are the conditions to make sure that when that election takes place, it has taken into account all these elements which are core causes of the conflict. And I want you to remember that phrase, the coalition of permanent losers. I can think of three countries in Africa in conflict now where that is a problem. Where? Well, Central African Republic. Mm -hmm. The two others, I will uh, observe diplomatic silence. <laughs> well, you, you, can, you can take the argument to Iraq, <coughs> where I think um, you know, the elections installed a, a Shia government and a lot of the Sunnis felt like a coalition of permanent losers. I think it's a very good way of, of thinking about it. And, you know, it's when you're dealing with fragile states, you're you're not looking for perfection. In fact, sometimes the international community thinks, you know, what does a great country look like? And they pick Denmark and think, well, how do we get everyone from where they are today to Denmark, uh, where people are eternally happy uh, and all the rest of it. Um, whereas actually, you're often looking for imperfect but yet workable solutions. And actually, in the report, we take the example of Lebanon because while on paper, when you look at the the ethnic differences and conflicts and all the rest of it. I mean, it, it still has lots of elements of instability and fragility, but the, the fundamental settlement of dividing up roles between Sunni, Shia, and Christian uh, meant that there was some agreements about power sharing. There was some checks and balances, which makes um, the process of democracy not only uh, safer, but also more workable for the long term. So we, we, are, we do try to point to examples, uh, often imperfect examples, but where at least progress has been made. So, um, as you said, it was really, it's, it's a really, so how long do you wait um, for to hold the elections? Because during that time, um, so you've got an interim government, which doesn't really have a legitimacy. You know, so how do you, with we the government... Put a, it's a very good question. We don't put a sort of timetable on, but we, we say three things that are important on that. One is try and get the power sharing and the checks and balances in first before the elections. Um, the, the, the second point we make is, international peacekeepers have a role to hold the ring, but all the evidence and the academic colleagues did all this work is that it is a, a wasting asset. Mm. Over time, international peacekeepers can get um, resented or even actually their presence can mean that the work that you need to do to build up security um, uh, doesn't happen. So I think that's a key recommendation. You've got a window of opportunity, but it's a window, not a forever. Um, and the third thing is while we are resolute in saying fragile states must be built from rebuilt from the inside with their own priorities and their own plans, we do look at examples where countries have escaped from fragility um, uh, and, and what they've done. Um, and I won't go to all, it's all in the report, but part of it is this understanding that the building of institutions on their own doesn't work unless there's a national story and narrative to go with those institutions. I mean, what are we trying to achieve here? In the end, you want a situation where people in the country concerned think, these are my institutions. I am prepared to pay my taxes to them. I am prepared to obey the laws that they come up with because these institutions mean something to me. And when you look at countries that have been successful, they've had a, a national narrative about where the country's been trying to go. And, and obviously it's self-serving for politicians to make this point, but political leadership is a very key part of this. You know, yes. Why is Botswana a success story and Zimbabwe not? It was the different leadership and the different narrative about the future of the country that the respective leaders gave. You could take other pairs of countries, Venezuela and Colombia, or topically North Korea and South Korea, yes. you know, that have made different choices um, about what their countries are about. And so national identity, nation building and institution building need to go together rather than be uh, separate thoughts. Donald, um, what, what would leaders in Africa think about this, this idea that you wait and you do you know, they've had a hard-fought one, they've, they've won the, the war, um, or they've, um, I mean, let's look at DRC. You know, the West is really pushing Kabila to move towards uh, democratic elections. Um, you know, what do you, you really expect the DRC can be stable um, uh, through elections? Will everybody in the East not keep fighting? I, I will answer differently, uh, Leslie. Uh, what is the purpose of government? When people go to an election, what are they looking for? They're not looking to change one group to another. 
they're looking to elect a group of people who will govern them fairly, who will deliver services, and who will not steal their money. That is the purpose of government, at least from the way I understand it. And so the idea of saying that just go to an election, even if at the end of it, there's no delivery of services, the people in power just steal the money, and let's talk about fair government. These things are important. So important that for me, they are more important than the form of democracy and the election. They are the substance of why people go to an election. The haven't seen countries where uh, an election is and the next day it is contested. And it is contested, so you have got civil war. Civil war ends up, you have another election. It is contested because the forms of government have replaced the substance of government. And I want to put to you that in many fragile situations, it is very important to get the content right. And that content is, will this group of people govern me fairly? All of us fairly. Will they provide security for us all? Will they deliver education and health within the means available? And above all, will they not steal our money? So what we have in South Sudan is that, precisely because, as Mr. Cameron says, I think they have been failing on this form. Delivery of services, all right? Security not provided, in spite of having this huge army. I have not been a diplomatic Masood, but this is an academic center, so you can protect me. But above all, the feeling that the particular arrangement is not fair for all means that you have the seeds for the next cycle. So for me, it's not about the, the form of democracy as defined in the West. It's about the content of governance itself, which is <coughs> at stake. One of the things, so in the interim, you, you, the, the report talks about quick wins. <coughs> Um, I remember in Liberia, um, uh, where Ellen Johnson Sirleaf just cleaned up the, the capital, Monrovia, mm. you know, and uh, painted homes and painted buildings, and that made a difference. Um, what are you talking about at Quick Wins? And at, at what stage um, do donors come in? Or, yeah, let's, let's start well, with the donors. On the Quick Wins, it's very clearly set out in the report, and I think it's important. Perhaps the most important thing about it is that they are priorities that come from the country rather than from the outside. And sometimes these things are quite surprising. You wouldn't necessarily think that cleaning streets or painting houses was the most important thing. I think we found another example where um, uh, cleaning mosques was that actually just massively reassured the public that the government was on their side and doing something that they wanted. So I think the first thing is quick wins matter. The second is that they should be uh, local priorities. We're arguing that donors should be involved as soon as possible because you know, money is essential, but it's trying to have that situation where the money is backing the national plan. I mean, within reason, if the national plan is train 10,000 jihadis, then obviously we're not going to support <laughs> it, but within reason, yeah. and that is the way it should go. To, to Donald's point about um, security, I think we, we believe generally that security has been underappreciated by the development world. Um, I'm a conservative politician, so I, I go around saying at home, national security is the number one priority uh, for any government. But it's interesting, as soon as you go abroad, you, you don't say that. You start talking about other priorities. And, and I think it is important. I think security has been under-emphasized, um, basic <laughs> security. Um, but, but quick wins that what you're trying to do is help a government where there's no trust in institutions and no trust in government build that trust. And so things that are visible and tangible early steps that can start to build that confidence uh, make all the difference. There was some fascinating research that the academics produced for the report that if you actually look at would you rather have a police force that's really effective in fighting crime or a police force whose interactions with the public are governed by proper rules and norms and ways of behaving it's actually the second that is more important rather than the first, which totally surprised me. But actually, if you think about it, if there's such distrust of authority in the state and the institutions, building that trust is one of the most important things you can do. Yep. Um, Donald, um, what would you say? I mean, you, you know, from Rwanda's point of view, for example, um, when you were finance minister, I remember coming over and, and uh, basically Kagame was, President Kagame was, to the West, you support us and you support my policies, um, or you know, be gone. What did do you think that kind of um, that's the solution? I mean, how do you bring in uh, Western donors when I mean, Dave is basically saying that you know, 
the aid hasn't worked. Um, so how do you, how do you... I'm not saying that, just to be clear, otherwise I wouldn't have supported, <laughs> but I was saying in these countries... In these uh, countries! In, in, the, the vaccination programs yeah. uh, will have worked, and some other programs, but the fundamental problem is some of them are as poor as they were 40 or 50 years ago. So there are many examples where aid has worked fantastically, Rwanda being, being one, Bangladesh perhaps being another, but in some of these countries, the overall effect hasn't delivered the change. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. I'm pleased you clarify that because, um, uh, well, if you look at these, these countries, I mean, wh when, when should donors come in and what should be their role? Should they come in and listen rather than impose? Let's talk about it. Uh, because I think it's extremely important, especially in the context of fragile states. Um, the best form of aid you can provide the country is one which has an exit point. The point at which the country can depend upon its own people to provide jobs, provide security, and so on. Now, in many of these fragile states, aid has become almost what I call chronic aid. Central African Republic, all right? <coughs> that kind of aid is completely unproductive. Now, since you ask me about Rwanda, let me answer this way. At the height of the crisis in 1994, what the international community do? They withdrew the nationals. They left the country to hold the baby, all right? So it has generated a sense of very strong national ownership. This country is ours, we own it. The politics is ours, the economics is ours. You want to come and help, fair enough. This is what you want to do. If you feel you can help, please welcome. If you feel in this approach we have, you don't fit, fair enough. I, uh, when I was in government, I dealt with many donors who, frankly, would come and give you the kind of uh, prescriptions which might work elsewhere, but they could not work in our conditions. And we said to them, thank you very much. We can do without this. But the others, uh, we are, said, look, this is what you want to do. This is what you want to achieve. We know you're accountable to your own taxpayers. All right? If there is a sweet spot, an intersection, we can work together. But you are free to take your money elsewhere. Now, the mistakes made in many fragile states is to say, ah, here's the money, here are the conditions, very good. I want the money, therefore accept the conditions. Yeah. And along the way, none works. Conditionalities don't work because they're not internally generated, and the money does not work because there are no conditions for it to work, period. So I do think that since we refer to Rwanda, there was a strong sense of na national ownership. There was a strong sense of leadership. And there was a strong sense that it will not be easy. It will take time. And it's still work in progress in many areas. But I do think that whether it is Colombia or Rwanda or Timor Leste, as uh, David was saying, that strong sense of national ownership, it is our country. It is our country. It does not become less of our country because we have less money than you. It is our future. It is our destiny. And therefore, we shall decide the politics, the economics, and we shall work with partners with whom we agree. And this is what we are saying in this report. I have one more question, then I'm going to open up uh, um, for questions. add one question. thing to that. Yep. I think, I think the, the aid community knows this very well, but the coordination of aid is sometimes a real problem, that if you have a fragile state where you've got multiple donors with multiple priorities, as we put in the report, government in that state can be a bit of a theater of, yes, pretending to do this for that aid and this for that aid, and you get the money, but actually there's no sense of an overall national plan. And so making sure, I think Rwanda did this very effectively, of coordinating uh, the aid through one point. But this is more widely understood, but it's a point worth making. So, so the question I have is, is more about the, um, the atmosphere around at the moment, where um, the US is, you know, America first. Um, you know, the UK has got its own problems with Brexit. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Asia seems to be, you know, carrying on. Um, what do you think? Um, do many of these countries feel abandoned? You know, when, when Donald Trump, for example, um, you know, talks about America first. You know, there is a, there is a, please forgive me for saying this. There's a trade dispute now between the US and my country, Rwanda. Correct. And it's scandalous. It's about used clothes, second-hand clothes. Correct. So as Rwanda tries to build its own textile industry, it says, look, we're going to limit the volume of second-hand clothing which comes in the country. Now, the US trade officials are saying, okay, you don't take our second-hand clothing, then you are going to close the Agua for you. I think it is scandalous. And I think we should say so. 
So I do think that in the world we live in now, now, to say that uh, one part of the world is dependent on another, that is old beans. We're in a world where completely interdependent. We become interdependent when there's migration or refugees. But when there's trade or strengthening multilateralism, suddenly the rich countries feel they can work on their own. But you know why? I think there was a former Italian prime minister, I've forgotten his name, who said that uh, if you're on the Titanic, whether in first class or third class, the destination is the same. <laughs> so for those, for those who think that uh, they can put big goals around the big economies, I think they're in for, for a surprise. Um, I do believe that at least we in Africa now understand that we are on our own. That's why we have just signed a continental free trade area, a continental free trade area, which I think will be in place end of this year. So that is the place to begin, integrating our economies. And then uh, we'll see what happens. Who would have said during the Cultural Revolution in China uh, that China would be where it is today? Nobody. Mm. But now China is a power. We are not saying that Africa become China one day, but I'm saying that we are part of this world. We intend to work with the partners from east, south, west. I think the, the idea of big and small in this world of today is a complete misnomer. I think if we're going to win the arguments for aid and development and trying to help some of the most fragile countries, we've got to change some of the arguments because what we've been doing up to now has not been working in some of the poorest countries. And I would say, so not only do we need to make that argument, but also it's a good time to make the argument to countries uh, perhaps like here in the United States where there's always going to be an appeal of helping the poorest people in the poorest countries, um, but there's also an appeal of saying this is in our own self-interest, that if countries collapse or fall victim to fragility, uh, the mass migration, the support for terrorist training camps, the backing of piracy, I mean, look at all the problems that Somalia, when broken, so badly visited on the rest of the world. So I think it's a good time to make these arguments um, in Western countries where aid budgets are under pressure. Um, and so I think we should make that argument and also make the argument, as, as I always did in the UK, um, that uh, development and defense and security are two sides of the same coin. I mean, actually, Jim Mattis put it very well here. He said, if you cut the aid budget, I'm gonna have to make more bullets. Yeah. Um, and we should, I always saw the aid budget as part of Britain's investment in its own security, um, as well as a way of, of helping the poorest on the other side of the world. And I think this report helps with that because we're saying here are countries that haven't made progress, that are hugely challenged, uh, and here are better ways of trying to help in the future. So I'm going to open up for questions. Um, uh, I don't want you guys to make some long statements and, uh, and we have nothing else to say or to contribute from this side. Um, but if you can ask brief questions, we've got about, how much time do we have? Probably uh, 20 minutes, 15 minutes? Oh, goodness. Please, anybody for questions? There's a mic, I think, that's going around, is there? Um, it's our sister. <clears throat> Hello, Ermal Hitai, IMF. So the, the idea of power sharing, including the electoral losers, is certainly quite appealing. But then in the long we, run... We can't hear. Yeah. 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 The idea of power sharing... I don't think that mic's working. Yes. Oh, okay. that's it. Uh, the idea of power sharing to include electoral losers and prevent potential violence is quite appealing. But then in the long run, uh, aren't we preventing a proper democratic culture from, from forming? So if this goes on for 30 years and then at some point the, the, the party that loses the elections surrounds the parliament demanding for, for inclusion, even after half a century, uh, where are we? No, I look, it, it, you shouldn't put off forever the idea of genuine multi-party elections. What you're trying to do is create checks and balances and shared assumptions about the way a country is going to work so that when you move to those elections, they actually deliver a change of government, but not the abuse of, of the institutions of that country. I mean, part of the point we're making is that, you know, democracy consists of so much more than the act of holding elections. The building blocks, the checks and balances, the rule of law, uh, fr certain freedoms, those things in many ways are more important. Um, and Putin's just had an election. I don't think it was particularly challenging for him. Um, so the building blocks of elections, the building blocks of democracy are often more important. But it, it's not to 
um, deny a country the chance of democracy, it's to make that chance more meaningful and more potentially successful. Yeah. And could I add that, uh, so in fragile states, you can build an electoral culture based on political confrontation or political competition and consensus building. And what the report says, probably in these kind of conditions, you are likely to succeed to build a culture of democracy by favoring the latter. Competition through consensus, working together. Now, if you favor what you seem to be saying, that the democratic culture is about confrontation, then the confrontation often leads to violence, as was in many countries. So building blocks to a fair government, which represents all, delivers for all, is what the report says. This report does not make choices for countries. It only says, build the house steadily, foundation, windows, doors, until you're able to move into that house. Time, a year, two, three, ten years, to depend on the countries. Uh, some countries can go there faster. Others might get there slower. It might be messy. It might be difficult. But it is best to do it that way. Go for it. Well, thank you very much. Fergus Drake from Crown Agents. Um, thank you so much for your, your comments. I'm particularly interested in the kind of challenge between risk and need and your comments around inversion. Is there a really interesting challenge to institutional donors here about not to invest in parallel systems and also to learn some of the lessons that went well with, I'm thinking, cash transfers in Syria or the Ebola response? Because there are often small windows of opportunity, I'm thinking Zimbabwe at the moment, where there is an opportunity to really change the dial and quite quickly and to support some green shoots. Yeah, um, lots of things to say about that. One is we, we say in the report that moments can often be, uh, there, there are opportunities that we should take advantage of. Sometimes you'll find a country that is, it, there's been investment into it from the aid donors year after year, but year after year a failure. And then there are sudden sort of magic moments, a new leader, a humanitarian crisis, something happens that gives an opportunity for change. And there, there's a real opportunity for the international community to make more of a difference. So we definitely say that. Uh, on um, the work of development finance institutions, um, I think we came across some quite interesting evidence that uh, for very good reasons, they often want to apply a whole set of environmental and social and economic goals um, and targets. But this means that the most fragile states tend not to get the investment. Um, I would say this, but banging the drum for the British DFI, the CDC, what was the Commonwealth Development Corporation, um, not only did we recapitalize it, but also the targets it was set was actually very much to get money into the most fragile states and to accept lower rates of return, to accept that on some occasions just not losing your money was a success. Uh, and I hope that others can follow that lead because otherwise organizations will meet their targets by investing in the less fragile rather than the more fragile. So I think those are two moments and, and the way we, we go about things are, are things we can look at in a different way. Yeah. yeah, Donald, I mean, I actually want to ask you about uh, the issue of risk that, that he, he wrote. I mean, you know, how do you attract um, investment or how do you attract even, you know, s small companies and firms to come into areas where there's immense risk? Right, right. You know what? The first thing any business person will ask for, whether he's a national or a foreigner, is security. <laughs> Period. Yeah. Shall I come out alive? Will my workers be killed? And so the argument says about security is directly about business and about livelihoods because these at the end of the day are the guys who will be creating wealth and you have to assure them security now the standard prescription now bringing peacekeepers <coughs> you really believe uruguayans will come to drc to die there at the end of the day it's got to be a short-term solution but in the long term the country has to be helped to be this police force judicial system and why not its army so this is number one. Number two, I think Paul will be explaining this more than I. The report argues for a big tent uh, where you have got government, donors, businessmen, uh, looking at these risks together. Some of them are perceived risk, which can be taken care of by these political arrangements. Others are real risks, and we have to go to the market and look for solutions. And uh, I think uh, Paul will be making a case that at the moment, some of this donor money could be more effectively used 
by actually helping those countries mitigate for those risks. At the moment, it's a timid exercise, uh, which I understand. But I think if this report's conclusions are accepted, we can make the case that part of IDA money can go into de-risking instruments, which we know how to do. But I think people with the money have to accept that it should be done. Now, one final point which I want to make. I looked carefully at the money which was flying to Somalia uh, before I left office, 2015. And I found that maybe, say, the port of Mogadishu and the airport would generate half, half a billion dollars. Maybe all kind of donors together, another billion dollars. But there was almost $1.6 billion from the Somalis living abroad. Mm -hmm. Until, of course, the Barclays, the Prime Minister, decided that no, no, there's too risky because of compliance issues. <laughs> I wrote the chairman of Barclays said, look, can we find a solution around this? Can we find over identifying the sender and the receiver, but not cut off this particular link? Why? For the 40 years, Somalia has been in crisis. What has kept that country going has been the ingenuity of its own people internally. Uh, drinks companies, uh, Coca-Cola companies, uh, food, they export animals in the Middle East. Uh, those in London and Scandinavia send the money back home. And I think a way of working with those business people early on, so they are part of the political solution, is extremely important. I do hope that, for example, as people in Somalia are looking for a solution, the business people will be on the table with politicians, with donors, so that they can give some of the experiences and the best practices which can help the country come back together. One final point, I'm sorry about this. Uh, international community allocation of aid is based on the principle which is called performance-based allocation. Mm -hmm. You perform well, you get more. You have no track record of performance, you get very little. So, result, fragile states get very little indeed, if anything at all, <coughs> except for some ring fencing facilities in these institutions, which are then subject to huge amounts of conditions, which David was saying. So even here, I think the IFRs will have to rethink the approach to these issues, because you cannot say, here's a fragile state, Here's a steady state situation. Refugees are moving there, internally displaced persons, flow of small arms. You cannot simply say you have, this country is fine, this country is wrong, and therefore they get more money, they get less. Reality is, refugees, small arms, will be flowing both ways. So I do hope that uh, in the course of uh, implementation of our report, there'll be a rethinking of how handle fragility in countries which are steady state, and in countries which are fragile, also the regional uh, approaches. But that is a long time ago I was in the bank. I don't know, maybe they are doing it now, but there's a guy there from the African bank. Maybe, yes, they, are, exactly. maybe they have improved on since I left, so you <laughs> never know. <laughs> well, I thought a good question uh, my colleague from The Guardian had asked you um, in the press session um, was, well, don't you think that the Chinese model works in, what, in many of these countries? What is the Chinese model? It's business. It's all about business. Well, you know, my argument would be, long term, um, you know, what, what, what are we talking about here? We're talking about states that are fragile because of conflict, corruption, weak capacity, but crucially weak institutions. And long term, we're talking about helping countries to build institutions that can deliver for their people. And there's no doubt in my mind that long term, that is about institutions that have democratic checks and balances um, that people feel they own and feel part of. And so, you know, I think those of us in the West who care passionately about democracy and real democracy need to sort of remake all those arguments that these things are not just good for our societies, they're actually good for our economies. I mean, at the end of the day, um, the rule of law is the, one of the most important things. The fact that, that your property is yours and the state can't take it away from you is, is the absolutely key determinant of a successful uh, economy in the long term. So I think part of our argument has got to be that this model is still the right model and that shortcuts um, to a different sort of way of doing things won't actually serve you in the, in the long term. Um, but I think it's a big argument we're going to have because some people will look at this report and say, as I said earlier, you're, you're walking away from elections and democracy. Absolutely not. We're walking towards a way of making it sustainable. Um, but I think we should have you know, really good conversations with the Chinese about why helping states to genuinely escape fragility is in their interests as well. Um, you know, the more they become a global presence and a global player, they will feel the effects of 
state failure and terrorism and uh, effects of climate change and effects of mass movement of people and the rest of it. And we need to make that argument with them and say that this approach is actually in their interest too. Um, Donald, uh, when you go to Ethiopia, I mean, it's incredible. I hadn't been there in a few years. I re traveled recently with Mark Green from USAID. I couldn't believe the transformation um, that had gone on. They completely embraced the Chinese model. Building, you know, building highways, getting things. The, the diaspora um, active in the south, building slaughterhouses, exporting meat, basically trying to um, deal with um, the cycle of drought. Um, you know, that, that has worked. What, what do you think? You know, I, I know why you're heading to, Leslie. Uh, you know you're not saying long. it. You want me to end up in the chicken and egg uh, situation? <laughs> Is it democracy or development? No, 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 no. You can't have chickens without egg, of course. Uh, so they go together. But what the argument is, and you pick this here, Bill, 100 million people, Africa's second most populated country. They have looked at their country, their history, and decided that state-led investment at this stage of their development is the right thing to do. And it's working for them. They have built the, Africa's first, uh, fastest rail between Djibouti and Addis, $3 billion. They're doing a big dam, huge improvements in uh, human development indicators. They are working on their democratic structures right now as you speak. They began from where they began. Do you know that Ethiopia, since you quoted Ethiopia? Uh, so it was an imperial regime. There are no elections. Then it was a Soviet-inspired uh, mm -hmm. uh, regime. Then they began a long march to, to, to democracy. They are still on that march. They would admit themselves. They will get there one day. But in the meantime, at least they're delivering services. They're delivering health and education. They're delivering 9% growth for the last 10 years, yeah. which is your Chinese model, which you seem to like. But I do think that if calling the Chinese model is uh, shortchanging the Ethiopians, I think that every country has to figure out what works for them. The Chinese made huge mistakes, which <coughs> you know very well. Oh. You, you remember the Great Leap Forward? Oh. 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 The Great Leap Forward was an attempt by the Chinese to copy the Soviets. That you can go from a peasant society to an industrial society in one generation. It failed in China. They had to rediscover their own model. So the bit of looking around the world nowadays is that there's no model to copy from a shelf. You have to look at all what's happening around you in the world, politically, economically. You look at your own history and you figure out, so how does my long march Toward democracy, what even look like. And this is what we're saying in this report. That is all. We're not saying there's a Chinese model, mm -hmm. Korean model, American model, British model. There are no such models. Even in Britain, the long much democracy from Magna Carta took them a long time. Sorry, Prime Minister, to, <laughs> to say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. took them a long time. I often right. make the point there was a uh, hundred years between Catholic emancipation and women properly getting the vote. Um, that's quite a long uh, <laughs> period of time. I mean, uh, the Maybe the thing we haven't talked about enough, and which is relevant to the Chinese issue, which is the adoption of market economics, which mm -hmm. is an absolutely key part of our recommendation, is that fragile states tend to have very underdeveloped market economies. They have uh, some very big firms and some uh, one person, lots of one-person firms, but very few um, SMEs, which are often the drivers of productivity and the, 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 the miracle of productivity that helps to create a genuine sustainable growth um, and in a way on the economic front we're making two arguments one the importance of <coughs> market economics backed by um, property registers and proper ownership registers and, and the rule of law and the second is a state where people have enough faith in its institutions and national story that they're prepared to give up consumption today for successful investment for tomorrow which goes to your example about Ethiopia and uh, building infrastructure and it's those two things. But I think all the way through, it's, these are not things you can take down on a shelf and put in place. It's about understanding how countries develop from the inside rather than having a, a model you impose from the outside. So I see we've got one more minute. And because we talk about gender equality, I'm going to go to that lady over there. I don't have a gender question, however. Um, given the number of states that are considered fragile in the world today, experts vary, but it's about 40 to 60 states, the limitations on foreign aid that we are beginning to see, what is the criteria for donors 
to select the states to get involved in along the lines that you're recommending. There are some people who say we ought to focus on the poorest of the poor, the states that are really fragile, and others say no, we ought to focus on the states that already show signs of resilience, of reform, and make them a success. Um, we can't do it all, so what are the criteria that donors should use? apart from their own national interest in strategic countries that they'll good, say. Uh, good great question. I think one of the criteria is, is there an opportunity for genuine change? Um, I mean, if a country is adopting absolutely bonkers economic policies like <coughs> Venezuela and is driving its people in its country down into a spiral, there's very little you can do at that point. I mean, putting aid money into Venezuela would be a total waste of uh, time. But if you have a country that is got a moment where it is trying to change the way in which it has done things, classically Rwanda after uh, 94, um, then that's, that's probably where the international community should spend more time and more effort. Um, Do you give up on South Sudan? No, no, I don't think you, it's not a question of giving up. And, and, and look, as someone who played a part in putting together the SDGs, we should continue to fight for all of them. Um, and if you take the British aid program, we will continue with our massive support for things like um, uh, Gavi for things like the Global Alliance, um, for education programs around the world. We'll continue with all of those things. But in terms of, I did shift the budget to be almost 50% in favor of fragile states. And in using that money, we should be thinking, where can we make um, the biggest difference? And I think that will often depend on the opportunities for genuine change. Mm. Donald, closing word. We don't have much time. I think the suit's giving you the I evil understand. eye. But I think this report does not... Uh, argue for incremental changes. It's arguing for a paradigm shift, for a step change in how we look at these issues. And so uh, how do you allocate external resources for fragile situations? There'll be some risk taking, risk taking. There'll be putting the countries in the driver's seat. And where you're prepared to back that particular country's approach, you have to accept a certain level of risks yourself. So we're arguing for risk mitigation instruments. So I'm hoping you're not referring to aid a closed envelope. You're talking about the kind of aid which will trigger domestic businesses in this particular country to expand the tax base, to fund education, to fund health. That will require a different approach and might include acceptance at the beginning to fund training of the police, training of the army, so that they can ensure security, so that business people can come and create wealth. So I think there'll be some rethinking of things we have done, but there need to be a step change in the way we have done things in the past as well. Well, thank you very much to Donald Depp, Kabaruka, and David Cameron. Appreciate your time and coming to explain to us. So I wonder if you can all remain in your seats while the speakers exit. Um, we will have a brief. Um, break, um, uh, grab some coffee, and then um, with Masood coming back um, with his panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.